Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Dr. Margarita McDonald. I'm the medical director at the Bariatric Medicine Institute. Today, we are starting out our February educational series. February is Heart Health Month. So today I'll be discussing visceral adiposity or visceral fat. What is it and why is it bad for my heart, no matter my size? So cardiovascular deaths account for uh, over 800,000 deaths in the U.S. each year. That's one out of every three deaths in this country. It's the leading cause of death in this country, well, that is until COVID, um, at 2,300 deaths, and that's one out of every 38 seconds one person dies from cardiovascular disease. One out of every 40 seconds an American has a heart attack, and one out of every 40 seconds an American has a stroke. Stroke is uh, the 19th reason for Americans to die in the U.S. Over 92 million Americans are currently living with some form of cardiovascular disease or the after effects of stroke. And what puts you at increased risk of developing severe heart disease depends on where you have most of your adipose tissue, which is your fat, and how much of it do you have. So how do you know if you're at risk? Well, let's take a look at your body shape. If you're somebody that is shaped more like an apple, you carry more of your weight centrally. If you're somebody that has more, if you're shaped more like a pear, you're carrying your weight a little lower. So visceral or central adiposity are those that are apple shaped. It's when you carry most of your excess weight in your abdominal area. Those that are pear shaped, this is called gluteal femoral adiposity. Gluteal for your butt cheeks and femoral for your thighs. And this is when you carry most of your weight down there. Now your risk for heart, heart disease is higher for those that have the visceral adiposity than those with the gluteal femoral adiposity. Those who have visceral adiposity also have increased risk for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and stroke. Now, so you're telling me there are two different types of fat? That's exactly what I'm saying. So you have subcutaneous fat. That's the fat that we all know about. That's the stuff that we could pinch more than an inch type of thing. Um, this is the stuff that is exterior. It's all over our body, just underneath the skin. Um, and most recognizable, it's in the hips, the thighs, and in the stomach. But if you eat too much, too often, or if you're just genetically predisposed, you can start storing fat, not just in the subcutaneous level, but in, the, um, in your abdomen, right around your internal organs. And this internal fat layer is called visceral fat. So this, you can't see, you can't touch, you don't even know it's there. Um, but it tends to be more active in producing hormones, while subcutaneous fat doesn't really do this. And that is why it can become problematic. It is also known as active fat, and as a result of these metabolic changes, it can increase the risk of serious health problems. So when we have increased... Um, visceral fat, it goes and affects a bunch of our different organs. So it can affect our liver, it can have fat surrounding the liver, and we can even have fatty deposition inside of the liver. It can affect our gallbladder and lead to um, gallstones. Um, it can affect our stomach, our intestines. And what happens is that the extra visceral fat blocks the blood flow and the lymph drainage, which is like our drainage system for our body, that supplies these internal organs, making it harder for them to get appropriate oxygen and for them to function and cleanse themselves. It can also affect your lungs by pushing up on the abdomen. It can make it harder for you to take deep breaths um, and it worsens our lung function and decreases the oxygenation and your body becomes unbalanced and it makes it difficult to breathe and to sleep. Now, visceral adipose tissue is thought to be more metabolically active than subcutaneous fat and can affect your body in several ways. So it can raise your triglycerides, which is the free fat in your blood, it can also raise your LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol. I just remember L for lousy. And it can decrease your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. I remember H for happy. It can also make you insulin resistant. And when you become insulin resistant, this means your muscles and liver cells aren't responding correctly to insulin. This causes your glucose level to go up, making you at risk for diabetes. Becoming insulin resistant also makes it harder for you to lose weight. And research study, recent studies have shown that 
This visceral adiposity puts you at an increased risk for developing diabetes and heart disease, and this is independent of any other risks such as smoking. Now, when we talk about visceral adiposity and heart disease, how does your belly fat affect your heart? So it is a major risk factor in heart disease, even more than your BMI in of itself. So someone's first heart attack can cause inflammation, stress, and changes in the arteries that can lead to the second heart attack. But increasing the visceral adiposity increases the risk for a second heart attack, even if you're on blood pressure medicines, medications to control your cholesterol, and diabetes medications, which are a lot of the medications that we give to patients after their first heart attack to prevent another. And if you look at these two hearts that are there, the heart on the left-hand side is a nice, healthy heart. It, the tissue, you can see it's pink. It has very little white pericardial fat surrounding it, which is normal. And then you have a heart that is surrounded by visceral fat. It's, you can hardly see the muscle tissue. The fat is completely encompassing the heart, and it makes sense as to why this heart couldn't function as well as it should. Now, how can you calculate your visceral adiposity? So visceral adiposity is often calculated on a scale of one to 59, and it's called an index. It's usually diagnosed with the bioimpedance scales or MRI scans. Those that have a healthy level are nine and under. If you have a visceral fat of 10 to 14, this is considered high. So you will wanna consider changing your diet and or increasing your exercise to help with this. And then if your number is greater than 15, this is considered very high, and you'll want to make some immediate changes in your lifestyle, including dietary and exercise, and you'll want to discuss this with your physician. Now, a way to measure visceral adiposity, if you don't have one of those at home, is um, starting off with waist circumference. So the waist circumference is very um, predictable in the risk of increased heart attacks. Um, and it's more predictable than BMI um, in regards to viscera adiposity, even, even for if you weigh the same amount as somebody whose uh, waist circumference is less. So it's an easy way to get a rough estimate. Um, you put a tape measure around your waist. Um, don't suck in your belly. You kind of want it a little bit higher than your belly button. We'll get into specifics when we talk about how we measure the waist to hip ratio. Um, but for women, generally, you want to be less than 35. 35 inches and above and 40 inches and above in men is an increased risk for visceral adiposity. Now, if you're of Asian descent, it does change. Those numbers go down lower. So for women, you want to be less than 31.5. And for men, you want to be less than 35.5 inches. And if you are, if you don't have a tape measure at home, use a string, use a belt, and then measure that to see what where your inches are. Now, another way of calculating out things is the waist to hip ratio. This is also useful in predicting your heart, um, your risk of heart attacks. The larger your waist to hip ratio is, especially for women, the bigger the risk factor is for heart disease. And this is more important for women than in men because our bodies as women traditionally are more pear shaped. So if you are someone who waist to hip ratio is higher than it should be, that puts you at increased risk. And we'll talk about those numbers in just a little bit. And so it's a really easy calculation. Literally, you divide the waist circumference by the hip circumference and you get a number. So here, if you're looking, you're looking at men are on the left hand side and women are on the right. For those men whose whip to waist to hip ratio is greater than 0.9, this means you're at increased risk. For women, if your waist to hip ratio is greater than 0.85, you're at increased risk. Now, you could be someone who is small, whose BMI is in a quote unquote normal range, but if your waist to hip ratio is greater than those numbers, you have what's called central obesity, and this puts you at the same risk of having heart attacks as those that have the same waist to hip ratio at bigger sizes. Now, how do you calculate out your waist to hip ratio? So here at our office, we use the criteria established by the WHO or the World Health Organization. So what you do is you find the bottom part of your ribs, you feel around, find is where is it the lowest, and then the top part of your hips, which is the iliac crest. And that space right in between the two, 
that's where you want to measure. You want to make sure that you're parallel to the ground, and a lot of times you do need somebody to help you. Now for the hip circumference, this is the widest portion of your bottom. So for those of you that are very hippy, you'll want that tape measure to be around that size. For those of you that have big backsides, you're going to want the tape measure to be able to measure all of that. And always, like I said, tape measure parallel to the floor, stand with your feet close together, arms at your side, and have your body weight evenly distributed, and wear little clothing. Now, as I said earlier, when you calculate out the waist to hip ratio, it's just the waist circumference divided by the hip circumference, and then you get a ratio. For women, you want to be less than 0.85, and for men, you want to be less than 0.9. If you're higher than this, this shows an increased risk for visceral adiposity. Now, how can you reduce your visceral adiposity? Eat healthy, well-balanced meals. You wanna focus on fiber and lean protein. The Mediterranean diet is really good for this. It's high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, fish, and healthy oils. You wanna reduce the plain white bread, plain pastas, go to more grainy foods, um, and definitely avoid processed foods. If you missed our talk on processed foods and um, high fructose corn syrup, go click on that lecture that says throw this one thing out. Um, it also gets into insulin resistance a little bit. And then of course, movement. Movement is very important. So sit less, move more. If you haven't read our blog from our personal trainer, please read that and we'll have some more information later on this month about how physical activity can help with your heart health. And weight loss in general, Decreasing your weight by just 10% with diet and exercise can lower your risk of heart disease and all other obesity-related health problems, such as sleep apnea. Now, do you want to know your risk? You can always come make an appointment with us. If you call to make an appointment, you get a body composition analysis on our body bioimpedance scale, and we'll do a uh, waist-to-hip ratio and let you know what your risk is. If you struggle with obesity, talk to your primary care physician. There are FDA approved medications to help you with this. If you don't know where to go, you can also go online and search for an obesity medicine doctor near you. And you can always call us, check out our website, see what's going on on our website and what we have to offer. Now, if you like what you've seen and you would like to follow along, please feel free to connect with us. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can always go to our website and subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. Now, finishing out our February series is for Heart Health Month, next week we'll have um, a topic by our nutritionist, then we will have a topic about physical activity, and the last week will be behavioral health. Every month we have a new educational series with a new theme, and so you can learn something new each week. We will be starting our virtual education um, exercise classes, so look out for that. It'll be twice a week, once in the morning and once in the evening, so you can exercise with us. These are my resources, and thank you for joining me. Have a great day.